What's up, everyone? Welcome back to the Collider Interviews YouTube channel for another interview. This is with one of my favorite working cinematographers out there, Robbie Ryan, the cinematographer behind Poor Things and at least one other movie that I will squeeze in a question about today. Hello, Hello Robbie. Nice to meet you and congratulations. Hello. Hello, Perry. Thank you very much. Lovely to be here. So as I teased, my first question is not about Poor Things. I am slightly obsessed with Medusa Deluxe. I have Ooh. to ask you one question about that. I'll go broad with it. I want Go to know it. the single most challenging sequence to photograph in that movie. Hmm. Uh, phew, there's, I guess the, because it's sort of like pretends to be one shot, but we uh, we always endeavored to, because we shot over nine days. It wasn't one shot, obviously, but we endeavored to try and do, uh, you know, the longest takes we could. So I think the first take, the very beginning of the film goes on for about a half an hour. So that was probably the biggest challenge. And, you know, it was the most fun because you're kind of like, there's a, what I like about, um, I don't like a lot of things about one shot films, I can tell you now, but what I do like about it is the the theatrical aspect of it where everybody has to be on point, not only the camera or the sound or the, you know, everybody include mainly the actors need to get it right. And it's kind of fun watching how actors adapt and don't, sort of go, I need another take. Because <laughs> they know they have only got a half an hour. If they kind of mess up within that 25-minute part of that half an hour, they will feel pretty, like, you know, bad, and as all of us would. So that that was a challenge, but that was kind of like the fun challenge. Um, I guess technically it was always, uh, you know, it, 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 the biggest challenge for me in a way was every other film I've ever done, I was the operator on. But this film obviously is all steady cam and I don't do steady cam. So um the we obviously tried to get somebody who was suitable who had, you know, a good technique, but also was able to be strong because it's a long process and who was maybe a little bit more because we we're low budget, somebody who was maybe doing it for the first time. So we got this really great guy called Jake Whitehouse, and he was a lovely sort of steady cam guy, but the challenge was for me to prove to him that he could do these shots because I'd be like rehearsing it with a camera and I go, okay, we'll do this. We we'll do that with Tom, the director. And then Jake would go, I can't do that. I'm like, why can't you do that? And he had this AR steady cam rig and I, you know, I, I would know so much about camera movement, but with that AR it kind of, it does it in a different way. So I was having to learn how he would be, able to achieve something or like why he was saying he wouldn't be able to achieve. And that was, that was a process I wasn't expecting. That movie is something else. The only reason yeah, why I'm, I'm able to pull myself away from talking about that is because poor things is also something special. <laughs> I'm just hoping uh, that all the conversation that is likely to be had about your work in poor things also inspires people to seek out some of your past films in particular Medusa deluxe, which needed a larger audience than what it got. It, it deserved it. it. It did deserve it. it. It just fell through the cracks a little bit, unfortunately. Yeah, but it's a it's a fun one. Yeah, and uh, he's a very interesting director. Yes. Tom, amazing. Yeah. I am very eager to see more from him. All right, poor things. Now, or actually, a broader question to start here. So, you've worked with some pretty incredible directors over the years. Do you find that the directing greats have a shared quality you appreciate, but then also, what is something about your ghost that makes him one of a kind? Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, I, I, first of all, I'm blessed to have been able to work with people I've worked with. I'm being so lucky, you know. It's it's a it's a real. I, I don't I don't I pinch myself most of the time to go. Well, how the hell did this all work out? But um, I guess the fact of the matter is, all those people I have worked with have all been really kind of like you know gracious as far as how to let me work within their world and kind of let me into the world of their shooting and like some directors like ken loach would have had a style very much from the get-go and i kind of i sort of figured out what that was and he was kind of like let me do that within a, a, a very patient way um but uh, you know all of this stems back from my work with andrea arnold because i think i wouldn't be anywhere without her and she sort of kind of was we're, we know we're peas in a pod in a way. We kind of have a lot of connection and, you know, the things we like most about cinema are similar. So she was totally kind of brought me on as a kind of, after her short film Wasp, we kind of like started really, you know, enjoying figuring out how to do the next ones. And we just have a really great shorthand now. So, um, you know, those are directors who I guess gave me freedom. And then working with Yorgos, like Yorgos is definitely 
um you know he has similar ways of letting me be free but at the same time i'm trying my best to figure out what it is that is the the world of yorgos and uh, like he's he's really unique there's nobody quite like him as a filmmaker i think because of his um his aspect on how he sees the the cinema he wants to make is very like there's not he's got a great sensibility and i i always feel kind of like wow you know there's not a film Yorgos hasn't seen. There's not a director he wouldn't know. And, you know, he's really got a definitive idea of what he's doing, but at the same time would happily not know what he's walking into a room to do and then figure it out. So there's always a contradiction. There's a lot of contradictions in his cinema and in his approach. And I don't want to say contradictions, but there's an, you know, he's an enigmatic director and it's a, it's a real joy to work with him because he really likes to have a, a, an environment to, be creative. I love hearing about that. All right. Going back to the very, very beginning when he first pitched this film to you, what would you say is the biggest difference between how you pictured it looking on day one compared to the finished film that we're all going to get to see soon? Uh, well, uh, the first time Jorgos mentioned this film to me was what the, we were at the screening for The Favourite in Venice. And I said, what do you do? What's, what's happening next? What's on the cards? And he goes, well, I'm thinking about making a film about a woman who wakes up with her baby's brain in her head. I was like... That sounds about right. That sounds right up your street. Yeah, good. I, I would love to be involved with that if that happens, you know. And uh, so then he sent me the script um, and I remember reading it really like, you know, with a lot of enjoyment and trying to figure out what the hell, because every scene just seemed to be fairly, you know, full tilt, full volume and crazy. And uh, I was like, wow, I don't know how, how is all this going to fit into one film? And, you know, that from that to when we started filming, uh, to the final film, I think it kind of punched above its weight and got close to what the script wanted it to be. You know, there's not many scenes that aren't in the film that aren't in, are in the script, I think. Very few. <laughs> Most impressive. Literally every single ounce of this movie, I feel like, takes the the visual style in particular and many other aspects of the film to an 11. Yeah, and yeah. Uh, I, can't, I can't believe how full such a lengthy journey for this one character feels it's really quite the accomplishment for a mere two hours and 20 minutes it is it is absolutely that and it's um you know down to the fact that emma stone is like just so wonderful to watch that the you know it's been kind of crazy this last few couple of months since the premiere in venice that we've been as a craft sort of team we've been out promoting the film a lot and obviously with SAG on strike the actors aren't allowed to do that so we've almost kind of become the promoters and we kind of it, it always I always kind of like go oh, yeah 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 blah 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 but then you're just going to have to pair it back to how f absolutely phenomenal Emma's performance and all the actors supporting her are and they they make the film so real and it's it's in a quite unreal way I am quite eager to get the actors in on this conversation I, know, I, I, I also uh, quite enjoy the, the crafts people getting this time in the spotlight well, because think, you all deserve think, it more than you get it well i think as far as this film goes the craft side of it is quite um you know really creative and there's a lot of a lot of stuff to talk about craft wise and um, I'm, I'm i'm totally happy to talk about it <laughs> all right so i want to get into one particular part of the process which i hear was unique for you the the idea of getting to build this world from scratch so i have a couple questions about that first can you give us an example of something we see in the final film that you know would never have been possible had you not been involved in that element of this production so early on? Uh, I think all of it's like that, really. It's, um, you know, everything was a construct. So, uh, and considering with something like The Favourite, me and yours made uh, was a completely location-based film. This is, uh, you know, all of a sudden, you know, up to the production designers to create the world in front of us and the costume designer and makeup and hair obviously so like uh, as a cinematographer it's always what's in front of the camera so i'm i'm kind of like not doing anything much different to what i would do on other films it's just sort of the things that are going on in front of the camera and poor things are quite elevated and and really really you know kind of interesting to film um but our as far as the process me and yorgos go through the cinematography kind of is not a million miles away from poor things but it was just a joy to be involved with how we could 
incorporate our camera moves within the set. And there's James and Shona would work from a a um a computer program called Unreal uh, Engine and Blender. And these are two sort of like very high end sort of 3D programs where you could see the whole set in its uh, digital format. And like you could walk through it in a 3D way. You could really see every aspect of it and we could kind of adapt it before it got built. So I do think Jorgis uh, was very keen on this piece of uh, software because you could kind of like build it knowing that it was going to be what you wanted and, you know, as close as what you wanted. So, like, for instance, when we walked into the the set that was the ship, it was, like, exactly how we'd looked at it as a 3D program. And it was, like, quite, un, you know, unreal to sort of walk into something that we'd been looking at for ages on a computer because we were filming in another set for a long time. So they built the this, this ship set while we were filming on Baxter's house, like Dr. Baxter's surgery and stuff like that. So that was all like taking up a lot of our time. So from the time we'd been prepping the Unreal Engine Blender stuff to when we walked on, we're like kind of a bit of a gap. So I never really saw the ship fully built until we'd finished the other set. And it was like, wow, it was like Christmas Day. You like walk in and this is this is the thing you'd been seeing on a, a computer screen for so long, but it was in your, it was like tactile and tangible. Whether it's using software like that or any other element of this process, is there something new and specific to pour things that you think is going to influence your work on other films going forward where you're going to want to take that technique with you? Well, they're all old techniques, ironically. We like all the old stuff, like um, shooting on film for one is feel like an old sort of technique, but it's having a bit of a, it's hanging in there. It's like it's like vinyl records, but um, I think within that niche, I, I would say me, me and Jorgis really were fond to, of the VistaVision format. We kind of shot on that for some of it, and that's a very old format, which was made in the 50s. It was a kind of Alfred Hitchcock, a lot of his films were shot on this one particular camera, and it's called a VistaVision camera. And because our aspect ratio is 166, uh, VistaVision's aspect, native aspect is 166 also. So that was kind of like, oh, this is something we should try out. And um, we would have done more of it, but it was unfortunately a very noisy camera. So um, for sync sound, it was difficult to do that. And we, Jorgis is very keen on getting his sound on set. So we only used it for like stuff like the reanimation sequence. And I, I like going forward, I would absolutely love to do a film on this division, but it's kind of going backwardsly forwards, if you know what I mean. Yeah, I, I definitely understand that and the challenges <laughs> that come with it. All right, I want to yeah. get into a couple of very specific scenes. First, first, I'll tackle that a little more broadly. Of all of the really ambitious scenes and set pieces you have in this movie, going into filming, which did you think would be the most challenging to photograph? And then all Ultimately, was that indeed the toughest of the bunch or did a different scene catch you by surprise? No, no, the toughest one for me uh, and I felt it coming. And then when it happened, it was that one. It was the um, when Bella goes to Lisbon and her world is like turned upside down in this kaleidoscopic space. And the set that they built was like huge, amazingly and uh, like elaborate sort of two quadrants of Lisbon pulled out of Lisbon and recreated in a studio in Hungary. And like, it was a, an epic stage really. And uh, obviously involved having to approach it with more lighting and try and create a sunny environment, but like mix it up. And the the, the main reason I knew it was going to be a challenge is because all of our, uh, our filming was in one studio in Hungary, but the build of this other place where they shot Lisbon, where Lisbon was getting built was in another studio, which was like a two hour drive away. So, we just didn't get to see it enough. That's my my post rationalizing of this is that we didn't get to see it enough before we got there, and I wasn't able to drop in on a regular basis uh, enough, and it just felt like it was always going to be an uphill struggle, and it, it turned out to be such. But you know, it, it was still an amazing thing to film. It just was a little bit more difficult. I love how you're like, I didn't get to do this enough. And what I see is like stunning, one of a kind. I don't know how you pulled it off. It yeah, is I'm, glad that's, I'm glad that's the case. Yeah, no, but we we felt that was, um, I think all of us had a bit of a kind of like a bit of a hope struggle with that particular world. Well, whatever struggles you powered through, it was well worth it. So now one right. specific scene that I absolutely have to ask you about. Please walk me through the planning of and the filming of the dance scene in this movie. And how did that compare to filming the dance scene in The Favourite, which is also kind of iconic? Well, um, yeah, I think 
the dance scene in the favor sort of prepped me enough to know what was coming with that. And like uh, Yorgos works with this con, um, choreographer called Constanza and she's like really fun and she kind of brings a great spirit to her dance routines. And like Mark Ruffalo and Emma Stone like trained certainly for like a good week I think I don't know how long they worked with Constanza on it. I don't think they they had that much time to work on it, but they just brought so much to it, and it was like because we were in the thick of a lot of filming, that was sort of like okay, we're onto the dance sequence now. Let's get on with that. And I I I know that they'd done a lot of rehearsing on it, but you know maybe still not enough rehearsing. And my main concern on on that scene from a camera point of view was that I wasn't going to knock down any of the other dancers because we were kind of up there with them filming amongst other dancers, and you know the camera's like going around on this small stage in a way. And, and you know I, I always was a little bit concerned that a big lump of metal was. Going and hit somebody but we didn't thank god and uh yeah i, I find um the choreography and that was f- really fun so that that really again being in front of the camera made me look you know it looks like we knew what we were doing but really the secret is in the way the dance was choreographed it is absolutely stunning i am eagerly awaiting the day when this movie comes out and hopefully that dance becomes the next hot tiktok trend <laughs> <laughs> i just need that in my life well, right so- now yeah, like they did it great. Yeah, they did it a lot of times as well. It was like it wasn't it wasn't a one off. I can tell you that much. It is so perfect, and it just like so speaks to their characters and what they're going through in the moment too, which just makes a moment like that even more effective. And the ending of it is hilarious when she throws the the glass at him. Yeah, no, so it, it's, it's got a lot of um, real good comedic moments and uh, you know good dancing. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Very impressive right there. All right. Now I'm going to ask the most evil question I have on my list because I'm essentially going to ask you to pick your favorite child. Do you have a single favorite frame of this movie? <laughs> it's a lovely question to ask. I I always talk about this one because I, I love it because I, I love a, a happy mistake in a film. And um, in the reanimation sequence, in the, it's in the trailer. Um, there's um, the bit where she kind of wakes up finally uh, uh, and the camera we we had was on a rostrum like it was above her and uh, it was that old vista vision camera and it i i i, I it wasn't a great camera because it kept on sort of like it was a bit of a frankenstein camera in its own way and it was running out of um power or like whatever happened the batteries ran low on it so when it was filming her uh it kind of slowed down and when you slow a camera film camera down the the, the effect you watch when you see the results is that it speeds up ironically because it's going like so just at the time where she opens her eyes it kind of slowed down and she kind of opens her eyes in a weird sort of like un- unreal way and i kind of feel that's perfect for her so i've, I've always said like been fond of that shot a lot <laughs> it's been a question i've been eager to ask is that pure performance or something else because something just seems so yeah, it looks weird, doesn't it? Like, it doesn't seem like she's like Pling. and uh, it's it looks like it's shot backwards but it's not it's it's shot forwards, but there's the camera slowed down, which made her blink open sort of quicker. Unexpected movie magic is the best kind of magic. I love it. I love it. All right. I got to let you go soon. So I'm going to ask about one uh, future film, because clearly I love when you collaborate with Yorgos. And I hear the two of you have already made another film together. I don't know if you're allowed to tell us anything about that one, but maybe can you compare the visual style of that film compared to this and also The Favourite? Uh, well, I think it's been said already, so I'm not going to get into trouble because I thought I got into trouble already about letting out things out of the bag on that one. But I think Jorgis mentioned it at the Venice Film Festival, so I'm allowed to say it. And we, uh, yeah, we shot for favor and poor things on spherical, uh, spherical lenses. So it's kind of like that sort of aspect ratio. Right but uh, the next film is shot with a widescreen aspect, so it's a anamorphic film. So that's that's different in a lot of ways right from the get-go and um yeah it was it was really enjoyable process and it's 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 a different film for sure to poor things how many films are like poor things smaller right smaller scale uh uh yeah i don't know if it's it's, it's a bit more bigger it's it's bigger in other ways but it's it's um it's certainly not like we built every set no it, it's on location there's not so many lights so uh yeah it, it was uh, if that means it's smaller yes it was smaller uh, yeah well like what does it mean for the production so, yeah. <laughs> anything yeah. you two work on together sign me up appointment viewing you never disappoint <laughs> 
Congratulations. Get on the guest list. Congrats. I'm there. Congratulations on Poor Things. And I cannot wait to talk about it for months to come and also years to come because clearly it's a movie that that I'm equally obsessed with as Medusa Deluxe and The Favorite. Keep telling people about Medusa Deluxe. (laughs) Oh, I plan on it. I plan on it. (laughs) That's so great. You love that. Brilliant. I will tell Tom that. Thank you. 